Good morning. Appreciate you. Good morning. Please turn with me to Psalm 125 as we look at the subject this morning, surrounded, surrounded. And as we've talked about before through the Psalms, David goes through it a lot. And it's not just David because there are a lot of Psalms I chalked up, like I said, to David. Because when you like somebody, you want to always give them credit for stuff, even when they don't deserve the credit. But there are times when the surrounding that he's talking about in the Psalms are good because he's not talking about being surrounded by adversity. He's talking about being surrounded by protection. And that's exactly what he is talking about in Psalm 125, as our brother has read this morning. And so as we talk about from time to time, ultimately, if I am asking God for a level of protection I can't create on my own, what kind of life would motivate him to give me the kind of protection as he will describe in those psalms? As the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people. Now understand, one of the first things I think, I think that I saw is in that verse. Um, he's talking about Mount Zion. And it's kind of like God having many different names. Like sometimes I'm sure you've heard it. You got your name that mom and dad might have for you affectionately. Then you got your discipline name, all given names, right? <laughs> so there are times when the Bible has the same thing. And there are times when he's talking about Zion. That's one of the things we'll get into in the short lessons this week. When he's talking about Zion, he seems, he seems, I haven't done the word study on it, but he seems to be talking about Israel or Jerusalem when they are at their best. Just like when he calls Israel by his old name Jacob, he's like Jacob is that name for when he's whooping <laughs> or talking about the path to whoopings, right? Israel is more along the lines of what he's talking about as my people. <laughs> and Zion is more like as my people. And one of the first things I begin to realize is in these times when I'm looking at, okay, what can I do to move God to want to surround me with protection? Just think about who you are at your best. And so I'm going to try to preach this sermon from that perspective. When I am at my best, going back to Psalm 120, since we're dealing with sets of seven, these are some of the things that he is either protecting me from or helping me um, act right, <laughs> right? Help me act right. So he wants to take care of me or look out for me on my behalf. Psalm 120, we're not going to read the whole thing, but it's, a, it's another one of those morbid psalms. And he's going to talk about in verse 6, too long have I had my dwelling among, no, sorry, among those who hate peace. And the reason why that stood out for me this morning is I heard an online content producer. He'll name him in the short lessons. But he is talking about how he had basically gone from a period of time where he was dealing with a whole lot of heat. And now he specifically mentioned God. And God and one of his co-hosts was reminding him, the things you're going, um, dealing with now, brother, the blessings, don't forget that they're from God. He's like, that reminds me of something my sister told me. And she said, uh, don't forget the way in which you handle the way you speak and the way you act can walk you right out of God's favor. And that reminded me of something. See, I am at my best when I understand what real hatred looks like. See, because I am at my worst when I'm like, shut up, you're just trying to rain on my parade, right? <laughs> and I don't want to hear it. I'm finally coming out of a period of difficulty. I don't want advice right now. I want you to join the party. Celebrate with me. But people who love you <laughs> are trying to help you understand how to make the party last, as we've talked about before. And so it's one thing if I can just take the advice from mom, dad, sister, brother, but I am at my best when I can hear it from everyone or anyone through whom God would bring me his truth. And that's when I'm starting to approach the kind of place. He doesn't promise me, God, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to, Marcus, I'm only going to say it through um, such and such. Or Marcus, I'm only going to say it through. No. It's my job to understand when it is that someone's speaking a word to me. And we talked about in the, the young people's class today, one of the reasons why I preached foundation early on, my ear to hear is a whole lot more open when I can immediately say, wait a minute, this is completely consistent with some things that I've heard God say over and over and over again. So then I can begin to immediately, when Jesus said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. The things that you already know are consistent with what God has been saying over and over and over again. So when you meet that person, you might not have ever met them before, but they can speak to you beyond my vulnerabilities, right? Because there are times when I just need a word. And like we talked about before, there are times people who are great at, um, there's that spiritual, the gift of spiritual discernment. There are some people who are exceptional at understanding where I'm emotionally at at any given time. And some of those people are looking out for my best interest, but they're not all looking out for my best interest. 
Sometimes they just know people real well and they won't know what to say at the right moment. And the thing that they're telling me is not completely consistent with what God is saying. And so my ear to hear the things that God is telling me that are not only coming to me at a time of emotional need, but are coming from a place of truth, have everything to do with whether or not I am in touch naturally through experience. Talking about nature and nurture, not just by nature, <laughs> but through nurture consistently understanding the things that God is speaking to me. So I don't just have to have, have it come from one or two sources. I can have it come from everywhere. It doesn't have to come from a person at all. <laughs> we talked about the illustrations, right? Did Jesus only preach from people illustrations? Jesus taught through the crops. He taught through the animals. He taught through all kinds of things. We saw, talk about social media and TV. It can be a destructive force. If your mind is tuned to the right things, as long as we're not dwelling on unhealthy things, people who never knew you, who are posting content or posting, it's one thing for me to click on it and be like, oh, yeah, it just seemed like what I want here. It's another thing when it just comes across the feed. You didn't pick it. <laughs> it just defies all logic. But it can teach you even when it doesn't say Jesus, 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 because you already know the things that Jesus is trying to tell you, right? But beyond that, beyond that, verse um, uh, chapter 121, I'm also at my best. We talked about this before. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Deliver me from the times when I assume one thing onto the passage and it's saying something else. When he's saying deliver me from all evil, we've talked about it before. He's delivered me from the evil and staring me back in the mirror as well. And I forget that one way too much, right? Because it doesn't make any sense for him to deliver me from the external evil if all I'm going to do is go back and wreck it. And so once again, this is going back to that principle. He's saving me from us, and he's saving me from me. I'm a part of us, right? And so I'm at my best when I don't forget that all evil means that there's some tough things that God has to say to me. But we've talked about that before. Psalm 122, though, Psalm 122, when he talks about this whole concept of justice, one of the things that once I get better at looking in the mirror, I can appreciate both sides of justice. There are, sorry, there are the thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. And oh, the times when I don't feel like it's within my power to get what I want. That's when all of a sudden I look to an external source. The courts look a whole lot more uh, favorable to me when I think I can, I can get their help in getting what I either need or I want. Oh, but once I've put myself or God's put me in a position where I no longer need help getting the things that I feel that I need or I deserve, uh, that's the point at which I have to realize, wait a minute, am I the same person now that others need to come to me? We've talked about it before, but look at it from this hopefully slightly different perspective. Um, when he is talking about, or Brother Barry is talking about on uh, Wednesdays, the Revelation, and those elders who are seated around the throne, right? And then he's talking about even beyond that, there are those who are dressed in, in white linen before the throne, and Jesus himself, when he's talking about the things that are promised, like we said before, it's not just all about what we get, it's who we are. And the question is, are we trustworthy when we now sit in the seat of judgment? Because it would be great if all I had to look forward to was heaven. Just come hang out, like we said. We talked about the party before. The party part is cool, but the Bible describes us as having responsibilities. Um, because you were faithful over a few things, I will now make you Oh, wait a minute, ruler over many. I don't get to shake that part of the job description. We've talked about that before. And so just as I want to go before people who will give me relief when I can't get it on my own, who am I when I'm in the position to actually be fair to them? Look at it this way. I've been watching a bunch of documentaries. I do that all the time when I finally have free time. Mom and I were watching one about Boeing. Why do you think I watch one about Boeing? Well, they're having a few problems, right? And we watched one that was back in my, my queue from maybe a couple of years ago. And back before they got back into the news, somebody did a documentary about someone who knew Boeing before and after the crashes. It's because they worked there. And they didn't just work there, they worked in quality control. And they got to see the, how, how things changed over time when Boeing's reputation was built on safety. That's how they made all that money. You see, sometimes we think we, we can't make money unless we're cutting corners. No. In a situation or a life or an environment where you can't trust people, there's a lot of money to be made in being trustworthy. Uh, it doesn't always have to come from being shady, but that's the way it feels sometimes. Boeing made a lot of money being trustworthy. 
And so they were able to sell product all over the world because they were, uh, their name was associated with trustworthiness. And so as one of those people who grew uh, with the company in the trustworthy years began to ring the alarm that we're cutting corners. And then eventually one plane fell out of the sky in Singapore. And then eventually another plane fell out of the sky in Ethiopia. They said that here's how it comes full circle. When this most recent thing happened, when the plane, plane nosedive and they showed you the picture of the people, the passengers missing skin on their head because they hit the, hit the roof, it's the same pattern. <laughs> they started to blame the pilots right away, right? So the first narrative was the screen went black <laughs> and we couldn't control the airplane. But give us a couple of days and we'll give you a chance to forget the same patterns that we got into in the Singapore crash and in the Ethiopia crash. And if you forget, now we'll start to blame some pilots that are a little bit closer to home. I need to shut up. But <laughs> I mention it because it's a pattern. <laughs> and it's a pattern that's true. What happened to the whistleblower? He's dead now. And the reason why I mention that is because in situations where people are relying upon us to be trustworthy, this person isn't somebody who's just blowing the whistle. <laughs> Are you feeling this safe getting on planes anymore? I mean, if a few more of them fall out of the sky, you might not be. But either way, whether you feel safe or not, the person who was there during the time when the reputation was built on safety and the time when they saw it decline, cutting on so many corners, so many corners, so many corners, that now we're in a situation where we're making excuses instead of making safe products. That's the person who is, hopefully, for me, I'll say I'm at my best when I want to hear from that person. Oh, and beyond wanting to hear from that person, because I got to take a plane before too long, God willing, I want to be that person. And here's the thing. The thing that makes it tough to be that individual is even when you don't come up missing, or you don't come up suicided, or you don't just come up dead, you know that there are all kinds of pressures that mount in the workplace when you try to be trustworthy in an environment that begins to slip. And that is the pressure that we all are under. It's not whether or not you're going to fall in the, um, the clutches of some uh, nefarious outfit that's going to uh, off you. It's do you have the pressure or do you have the, uh, the courage uh, to stand alone when everybody else is like, I'd just rather sit this one out. And why is that important? Because when I'm asking God for vindication, when I'm asking him for justice, when it's outside of my control, I don't want him to sit that one out. And so ultimately, if I'm in a situation where I am saying, God, I want you to deliver me into places where you are surrounding me as your people, ultimately he is going to ask you, do you have the courage to be that for someone else? Do you have the courage to be the person who is transparent in a situation where our bucks or our dollars or our livelihood or our well-being is kind of more, at least for now, seems like it's more invested in secrecy. So I, I, I dwell too much, I will say. But the reason why I mention these things is Boeing is not the only company that is facing these kinds of dilemma, right? I said one of the reasons why I appreciated having to come back to the workforce before I came straight back to the pulpit is because I had been out of the workforce for about 10 years before I, I realized it. I blinked and 10 years were gone. And I'd been in ministry for that long. I'd forgotten what it was like to work. But see, I came back into a workforce where I knew the pressures, right? And so I don't have to say a whole lot of names. I just know that some of you, as I listen to you talk, you, you're describing situations that sound real similar to that places I've been not very long ago. And so without you having to name your situation or share with everybody, I know the pressures are out there. Why? Because if we were all on the same page, wouldn't these churches be a whole lot more full? <laughs> wouldn't everybody from your job be sitting right next to you talking about, let's tell the truth, guys. Let's go, you know, let's Shine a light on everything that's going on here. No, you're under pressure. <laughs> and it was like that before I went in the ministry. And thank God he gave me a chance to say, see, it's still like that now. <laughs> and so to the degree that you realize you want God to bring you into places where he is surrounding you, I wish I could preach a happy sermon and say, it's always going to keep you in comfortable places. No. It's going to require you to take on some of the pressure that he endured. Why? Because he came here as Jesus and he gave us the example of how it is to walk outside of comfortable spaces where, shh, we're just keeping the, we're keeping the company secrets, right? All right, don't get me wrong. Don't go out and do some things that will get you fired. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, one of the things that it's easy for me to do as a preacher is to say, study it out. Ask God what he would have you do in your situation. But at the very least, let us not be a part of the thing that actually... Um, 
makes it more difficult for people who are trying to overcome the pressures on their job to do what is right. Because ultimately that means we are now becoming a part of the problem that God is going to have to protect his people from. How do you know? Keep reading with me. Keep reading me with me. Sorry. Psalm 122 verses 3 and 4. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up. The tribes of the Lord as would do, sorry, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. The thrones of judgment, which is where we were before. Uh, the thrones of the house of David. Understand, understand. It didn't make a whole lot of sense to me when I was just reading through all oh, the tribes, right? But wait a minute. Um, God willing, when he is come calling us all together um, in unity, uh, one of the things that uh, you realize when you look at this period in Israel's history, the period of these psalmists, is they were dealing with the real difficulties of bringing different tribes together. And so as David was going back into uh, the city of David, after Absalom had basically driven him out of his own kingdom, there was a man by the name of Shimei. And while David was on the out, he was throwing rocks and he was kicking. And he finally had his moment. He's like, I knew it, David. I knew you were evil the whole time, this and this and that. He basically did it in the form of curses. Oh, but when God brought him back, or David back into the kingdom, Shimei had to face the man that God was not through with yet. And why is that important? Shimei, quite possibly, I think he was, kin to Saul. And so when we're looking at this whole concept of all the tribes going up, there are times in my life when I'm at my worst, when I can only see fairness or what is right through the lens of my close affiliations. And so Shimei got in trouble because he could only see life through the lens of what was best for Saul and the tribe of Benjamin. He was not ready to move on to see the things that David or God was doing through David. And so through that limited lens of only what was best for Benjamin, he began to curse what God was actually doing after he began to move on. And so I am at my best when like David, like we said, the comparison is what was the mistake that David did not make? David did not fall into that same line. Why? One, because he understood the emotional place, and this is me ad-libbing, that Shimei was coming from. And two, wait a minute, I should have been dead anyway. Like we said, I just committed a sin for which there is no sacrifice. So how am I going to come from that position of being a dead man, caught in the sins that I was caught in, to now want to have Shimei killed for coming from a place of hurting, Right? And so the first thing David got was, if I'm going <laughs> to truly bring everybody together, I'm going to have to come from a place of, I think one of our brothers already said it, I'm going to have to come from a place of forgiveness, right? Because ultimately, I'm going to good, it's, it's not just me being a good guy, I'm going to look like a fraud. Because for every day I live now, everybody's going to remember the sin that I was caught in. And so that judgment seat that was looking so fair before I got caught up with Bathsheba, now I've got to judge every day of my life moving forward from the perspective of the man who was caught up with Bathsheba and killed Uriah to try to cover it up. And so that doesn't give me the right to pretend that people who are coming to my court aren't sinning, but it requires me to take a step up, to have just as much of a commitment to truth, but maybe even more of a commitment to mercy. And so when we're looking at it from that perspective, more of a commitment to mercy, go back and understand, just like Shimei might have been forgiven for simply speaking out of the side of his, was it side of his mouth, side of his neck, just because he was hurt that, that Saul was no longer the guy. And he liked Saul a lot, right? Understand the same way. There are people who we mentioned before who are trying to stand up for things that are actually healthy. And God be it, uh, far be it from us to add to their misery. If the Shemaiahs in this world need forgiveness, the least we can do is at least try uh, to carve at least somewhat of a safe space of those who are trying to maintain their integrity and their composure and their character, basically trying to maintain the image of Christ on the job. But going on, going on, it's going to say in verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. The other thing I would love for God to do, um, in addition to helping me understand how to create a healthy amount of distancy, because um, it's not always going to be the case that uh, to the degree that I have uh, a rigid, um, a situation where I cannot fully separate myself from, uh, like we said, those who, I think this is a part I skipped over. Um, when you're looking back in Psalm 120 at a situation where um, 
even at your best, even when um, I'm at my best, you are never going to necessarily um, persuade everyone to love you. That's just not the world we've been brought into. And a part of maturity is understanding how to function in a world of, um, in some situations, just rigid, rigid resentment. But one of the reasons why that's so important is because rigid resentment doesn't have to stay that way. And a lot of my ability to, what's the miracle if Jesus said, if all you ever do is you're kind to people who are kind to you, what's great about that? Everybody, even the pagans do that. But God is showing a work in me if I can begin to rebuild relationships with rigid resentment, right? And so ultimately, I'm not asking God to put me in perfect places where I never have to be around people who don't like me very much. <laughs> I would love that. I'm, I'm, I'm mocking it like I don't pray for that, right? <laughs> but that's really what I want. <laughs> Over time, I get adjusted to reality. <laughs> and like we've mentioned before, I begin to appreciate the friendships that develop in difficult places. And that is more of the evidence of what God does. See, under my own power, I'm just in comfortable places. But under the power of God, I'm allowing him to leave me in difficult places until, like it says, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. It doesn't mean you're eventually going to be popular with everybody, but you don't get to see the relationships that can develop out of difficulty if you don't give him a chance to leave you in difficult places. I'm convicting myself. <laughs> However, as we continue to go on, um, look, at, uh, look with me at the upside, the upside. Okay, now if I can get to a place where I'm allowing God to leave me in difficult places, where he's allowing us to, God willing, grow relationships out of animosity. And what are, what are some of the benefits? Well, in chapter 124, he's going to talk about snares that were left for him. Or this psalmist is going to talk about snares that were set for him. Uh, verse 6 is going to say, blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. And in the short lessons this week, we're talking about the difference between being set free and having the snares broken. Before I even looked at this passage, some of the most difficult videos I've seen within the last year or so on YouTube were animals that are caught in traps, and they look just so miserable. You see this big metal trap around a little ankle. You're like, that's broken, first of all. And then just it just looks, yeah. It's one of those things where I think we can all have at least a little bit of compassion. And so it's one thing if we take it back a step and we put it in another perspective. It's one thing if God knows that life is a minefield, right? And he uh, frees me from a, oh, Marcus, there's a mine right there. Boom, I got it for you. But I still got to walk forward. See, what I want from the God who surrounds his people is a God who's clearing the minefield, which is one of the reasons why he says, not just in, with return, in, in, I'm sorry, in terms of giving, right? But in terms of life. Um, to the one who gives sparingly, you will also receive sparingly. But the one who gives bountifully, that's the one to whom, oh wait, now I'm starting to see that whole concept of surrounded. And so it's beyond just money, because when Jesus gave the illustration about taxes to Caesar, he pulled out a coin or told him to get a coin. Whose image is on the coin? Caesar's. He didn't have to say the rest. Whose image is on us? All of us. God, thank you. The Lord owns us all. And to the degree we give our lives with that perspective, now we're talking about just like you, you would want more than just one mind in a minefield cleared, you want the whole thing cleared. I am at my best when I am living with that perspective. There are other people, I, might not, I don't have mind clearing capabilities in my life. You might ask me five questions about what's going on in your life. I may, if I'm conscious, conscious enough to pray and shut up and listen to God, I may be able to mouth the answer that he has for you to one of those. But if I keep talking, up, talking long enough, I'll mess it all up with my opinions about the others. Right? And so ultimately, I am at my best when I am praying to God to give me the answers, as many answers as he has for you through me. I'm not trying to lose myself in the fact that he's God willing at my best. I'm begging for him to talk through me. Why? Because I, I mean, you think I'm just speaking from, uh, I know of people who have uh, messed up people's lives with bad advice. No, I've given bad advice. That's how I know. <laughs> right? And so to the degree that I'm looking in the mirror, I don't like going down that road anymore. And even though I'm still tempted to be like, yeah, it's me talking. I'm the one. Yeah. <laughs> well, he'll let me talk. But God willing, I'm a prayer.
approaching who I need to be when I allow him to um, use me to just clear up more than just an isolated question, but kind of say the things that are beyond me so that he can clear up as much of that minefield in other people's lives as I want him to clear up for me. I don't have to do the whole thing, but God willing, I can do my part and then point him to a brother or a sister who can do their part. And once again, it's why we're woven together into a body, right? And so that coming together collectively, <laughs> we can have the attitude that it's not just me. I'm not the one who has the answers, but together we can help each other through those minefields of life. And so when I appreciate the fact that I don't want to just be set free from the traps, I want them broken, <laughs> then I begin to have a different perspective on the way in which I want God to use me. Beyond that, in chapter 125, like we mentioned, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, verse 1, which cannot be moved, but it abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. From this time forth and forevermore. Skipping over the rest of that to get to chapter 126, 126 verse 1. Why? Because you know, it's, it's enough for me to, to try to, you know, preach the things that I think God wants said uh, on a Sunday to help us, you know, live a better life, walk things out in a way that becomes easier. But at a certain point, you just want things to become easier, right? You don't want to have to try to remember what to do leaving church or whether or not the preacher gave you at least one thing we can walk away with that I can recall, whether or not the study guide is in the right order and whether Cody got it right this time or I'm just kidding, sorry. It's an inside joke with the, the building. Every time I make a mistake on the study guide, ones that you might, might catch, it's really Cody who did it. <laughs> or he's the one who at least gets blamed. And so anyway, whether or not all that's in order, eventually you want to just be able to relax and enjoy life, right? And that's what this psalm is about, Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. And then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. And as we finish out the psalms, amen, with these psalms of ascent, all that uh, talk about uh, who I should be and uh, how can I be the kind of person that people can trust just like on, all that is to get us to that point, right? It's to get us to places like Psalm 126. So it's not me trying to defend. It's not me trying to repent. It's not all the heavy labor. Why? Because I heard somewhere that he promises that once we finally shut our eyes and hopefully um, go to a place where we see him in peace, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. <laughs> and he offers us a bit of rest. And here's the encouragement in life is we don't simply have that rest to look forward to. God willing in life, if we are leading the kind of lives that he would want to surround, even though the storms are still going to come, he is giving us down payments. It's like we talk about down payments on a house. That's not necessarily good. If I could, I want it all paid off at once. You know what? Same thing. I want heaven right now. Don't work that way. <laughs> Sometimes I got to be happy with the down payments, right? That I made a little bit more progress toward that final place of ownership. And so if I get that in paying for my car, if I get that in paying for my house, understand that sometimes these are just life illustrations. God didn't have to structure life this way, but sometimes he wants to give us something that we can relate to as we wait on the benefits of a final rest. And that's what it is in heaven. And so there are times where periodically, if I go through the struggle of being that one weirdo at work, if I go through the struggle, of even if I'm not that one weirdo at work, I simply have enough to encourage that one weirdo at work to just take another step forward. I don't have to be them. Sometimes it literally says, sometimes it's not before it was my ministry, or I thought it was my ministry to go preach, when we would go knocking doors. You don't think I still remember the people who, it, it sounds goofy, if you just give them a cup of water? I remember the folks. Who brought me a cup of water when I was knocking on doors in hot days, right? So you don't always have to be the person. But if you hand out enough cups of water, you might be surprised at where God takes you <laughs> and what kinds of things he does in your life, right? And so it's not huge steps. Sometimes it's simple acts of kindness for people who are in the midst of their struggle. <laughs> and so that's all we have to do. You don't have to be content there, but just let God, as we've said before, continue us down that path that leads us to our own rest. So let's be a refreshment for somebody else. Like you see people running, and her sister Ashley visiting with us today, runs long distances. Ashley, at your next race, we're going to pull all those people and hand you water, fold up all the tables, and you just get to run. Enjoy that. <laughs> I think you enjoy the people 
that give you a refreshing drink of water, even though they're not running the race. They don't get the marathon glory, but I'm pretty sure the marathoners appreciate her. So whether we're running the marathon or hanging, um, handing out the water, let's not overlook the value of those simple acts of kindness as God willing, he restores us to our temporary rest until we get to that rest that is more permanent as we together stand and sing.